start shall we start right. we now yes um so uh, on behalf of uh, the center for women's development studies uh, i welcome you all this is the fourth of our special lectures commemorating 40 years of the center um and today um it gives us great pleasure to welcome in our midst uh, janet price uh janet is an activist a writer a scientist an artist and a thinker whose inquiries into questions of gender and the epistemologies of the body cover over 30 years of joint feminist research and activism with friends and colleagues these inform her moves to recuperate cultural memory relating to the phenomenology of disabled mind and body memory and post colonial sexuality through articles and through art production as an activist the focus of her work is on bringing groups with different understandings of health and justice together uh joining issues of disability gender and sexuality to foster joint initiatives janet has advanced training in the field of medicine and is now currently an honorary research fellow at the liverpool school of tropical medicine where she has since working there in the early 2000s been involved in the development of their intersectional approach to questions of gender disability and other inequities she is involved <clears throat> sorry she is involved with disability activists globally in developing thinking around sexuality and disability and in strengthening the role of disabled women in south asia she has had a specific commit commitment to enabling interchange of disability and art and ideas with the uk and she has co-authored or worked together with a number of um people from south asia uh, nilika gunavardhane comes to mind um nidhi goel reno adlaka our own colleague and anita ghai amongst others janet learned about co-programming disability art with ruth gold and has been commissioning and organizing a range of events including with the university of liverpool uh they came together as artists and co-producers to delhi in 2015 to co bring uh uk and indian disability artists to compare arts and production experience so um she is very much someone who is part of our world here in south asia uh in terms of the work and the uh writing the speaking and the and the art production uh, earlier on she mentions that she has been working with professor margaret childrick on feminist theories of the body primarily in the field of disability uh she is also engaged in intersectional textile art that is three dimensional work pieces influenced by textual mapping of disability body land and sea so this is the most remarkable um introduction that i've ever come across janet so <laughs> welcome welcome to our, to our center and please do begin your talk uh before i i i uh, hand it over to you just to say that um this is probably our first online presentation with on and around disability issues we've done a number of them before but they've been face to face um my name by the way is mary john i'm currently the acting director here we are fortunate to have a uh, two signers two sign interpreters to help us in matters of access preeti sapra and pinky khandelwal and we are also assisted by sundaresh r and aklak ahmed who are our staff support staff here at cwds in terms of technical expertise now uh, over to you janet thank you very much mary um first of all i'd like to congratulate the center for women's development studies for 40 years of exciting very groundbreaking work on women and gender that it's undertaken i'm going to look forward to the next 40 when i will be ce celebrating my centenary so <laughs> let's see um i'm one of them delighted to be invited to talk to you on with you today so to start with a description of myself i'm a white woman who uses a wheelchair and crutches i've got graying hair a thin face and silver drop earrings and i'm wearing a green cardigan sitting in a blue office chair behind me is a white wall and a quilted blue blue cloth throw 
Um, to start, dis disability matters, nationalist imaginaries, economic crises, and the impact of a pandemic. Now, the COVID pandemic has been a time that has exposed the deeply riven inequalities between and within nations of the globe. Both India and the UK have seen high levels of infection relative to comparative countries. Um, and sorry, my computer is refusing to talk to me. Right, it is now. Uh, relative to comparative countries. Um, Oh, Lord, everything's slow today. Um, OK, both India and the UK have seen high levels of infection relative to comparative countries. Death rates that massively exceed the headline COVID numbers and health services that have struggled with providing care for both COVID and non-COVID patients. Lockdowns have been instituted, but in a failing attempt to halt the pandemic spread. Now, the background in both countries has been one of populist rhetoric and neoliberal economics that have led policies of austerity with cutbacks in welfare and state spending. This pandemic era of rising precarity has seen millions more people experience hunger, poverty and homelessness, whilst the wealthy have become more wealthy. 11 trillion, I think, is the latest count. In what follows, I address these issues using the epistemological structures of disability. I'll lay a background in India and Britain's colonial and post-colonial histories and look to the ways populism, neoliberalism and attitudes to disability in Jasbir Puar's words, ready some bodies for naming. And disability theorizing is a decolonial project. The epistemological claims that developed through the European Renaissance and Enlightenment and the border thinking that served to distinguish the boundaries of Britain's empire held notions of a reframed, remapped embodiment at their centre. In India and Britain, the historic consequences of colonial moves have constituted a body that is always already racialized. Re repeated turn towards a desire for the Orient centered around the Occident, creating a colonial view of the whiteness of the nation and of the body at home. This is using Sarah Ahmed's work as a background. The abled body, fit and male, stood as the mark of the colonial ideal against indigenous Aboriginal peoples and tribal peoples, deemed as less intelligent, animalistic and diseased. Thus, colonial endeavours served to constitute the markers of the disabled body. They aided the rise of eugenics and constituted biopolitics, establishing health and population dis disciplines that divided the fit from the unfit. Pro productive workers were directed towards wealth production, managed through financial and welfare measures, and meanwhile, British imperial rule impoverished working class, lower caste people. Example, Britain, um, Manchester and India. You see the cotton industry decimated in both places. It rendered them less able and pushed them into precarious living. Now, money and the state became ever more incorporated into the definition and management of bodies. Okay, sorry, I'm going to read this well, it might be safer. Um, those populations were separated and labelled, and those with an unfit status were oriented towards domestic and institutional spaces. Compulsory able-bodiedness emerged as a marker of the normative and a point of constant endeavour. People feared loss of capacity and the dissolution of bodily boundaries, haunted by bodily unity. To return to boundary thinking, on the 19th and 20th, in the 19th and 20th centuries, the colonizing nations of Europe waged constant wars to establish borders and possessions. Indians were sent off to wage war for the British and the desire to reclaim a national home grew whilst colonizers wished for their British home, represented as the heart of empire. In the days before Indian independence, Britain unsettled its boundaries by imprecise mapping, 
with a cartography that disrupted the coherence of the underlying geography. It was oriented away from India with an eye towards a British home, playing a part in the consequences of partition. Indian nationalist imaginaries of ableism fed into the struggles for a unified state with unbroken bodies and boundaries. And meanwhile, concom concomitant physical and armed struggles increased the number of disabled human bodies. The diaspora of partition oriented towards finding themselves anew, a home in India or Pakistan. As Britain decolonized, it maintained crown rule in many places over this period, leading, for example, to the Windrush generation who traveled from the Caribbean to England in 1948, calling it their home nation. Recent 21st century English political turns to nationalism have raised a specter of being overrun by immigrants from the global East and South. Political rhetoric calls to home, nation, and the ghost of empire. And underlying all three is the ideology of able nationalism, that to re reap the rewards of citizenship, individuals should meet standards of aesthetic appearance and corporeal cognitive and sensory functioning, materialized in the UK through the complexities of the British citizenship tests. Under the Tory so-called hostile environment policy, Windrush settlers, many who've been living in the UK since they were babies, have been deported. Now, the appeal to home was located within familial boundaries, at the centre of which lay gendered cultural imaginaries. India was mapped onto the broken body of Mother India, dismembered by the partitions of East and West Pakistan and the uncertainty of Kashmir's status. So Mother India loomed over this period, invoked historically and politically, her always already broken body speaking to the disabling of India at the time of its birth. And in Britain, Britannia herself was crucial to imperial imagery and has returned in the current day, racing her chariot across the political cartoons of both right and left as we try to leave the EU. In the recent era, one of the most significant warnings of the failures of neoliberalism came with the loss of homes, always central to these debates. At the heart of the banking crisis of 2007 to 15 were dehistoricized bundles of mortgage pro products. Mel Chen argues that in naming them toxic assets, flesh was placed upon them, opening financial corporations to contagion, quarantine, mobility, impairment, and cleansing. Rendered material, this medicalized language, structured capital in what Chen calls a global debility capacity machine that underwent laundering post-collapse to ensure that the major financial bodies were clean, fit, and healthy, restored for action. Neoliberalism could expand its networks again, re-energizing the era of the Anthropocene. Our ongoing destru destruction of the globe and its national resources has been a stimulus for inciting a slow fire <laughs> us. In India, we see forest destruction, mining, childhood starvation and farmer suicides. In the UK, nuclear power development, high-speed rail construction, rising black-on-black -black knife crime, and youth anxiety and depression that's through the roof. Through the mixing of assemblages of the forest and the urban in China, COVID-19 emerged. There's a disruption of ancient links between indigenous knowledges and the earth. The rhythms of nature are being disrupted. Broken bodies increase of the land and of the people. And people are living in what Shildrick terms a state of ontological precarity, never settled, always anxious, uncertain what the future holds and impacted by debility. This is the effect of the Anthropocene. Now, in 2019, the global economy was broadly heading for a slowdown. In India, the general election of April and May saw the return of Modi with a BHP led government. Uh, winning again, and in the UK, the returning anti-EU Tory government was focused on Brexit. 
Boris, for all his buffoonery and mumbling manner, knew the value of a simple idea, oft repeated, let's get Brexit done. Yet on the day in February 2020 that Britain signed the bill to leave the EU, two Chinese travellers were in hospital in the northeast of England, diagnosed with COVID-19, and their contacts were being investigated. With the market on the edge, financial bodies actually breathed sighs of relief with the COVID pandemic emerging to disguise their, the coming slow dip into depression. It offered a way to provide new sources of wealth creation through disaster capitalism. Supply chains to produce masks, PPE and ventilators, a vaccine development programme were both established. And control societies drew on test and trace programmes, storing ever more data on individuals. Wealth increased, but concentrated in fewer and fewer hands. As this epidemiological spectre loomed, lockdowns in homes were instituted in India with only four hours notice and with marginally more in the UK. A space that's usually spoken of in registers of comfort, ease and social welcome became a space marking the boundary against the virus as contagion spread. While Boris was completing a deal with the EU trade on them in December and delighting in dreams of empire to come, 40% of the nation was on the verge of returning to high levels of lockdown. This domestic incarceration was due to further mismanagement of a new circulated, highly infectious COVID variant. Simultaneous lockdown impositions of what was effectively ruled by England on Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales, um, the parliaments there by the UK, has seen numbers for independence and the breakup of the UK as a possibility rise. So as we all live, live through the pandemic, it's very instructive to look at how disability models interpret the virus. Spiritual views, particularly karma, hold that disability is due to past dis misdeeds, whilst charity models see personal problems as the cause of disability that need to be sort of supported and remedied. From a medical perspective, disability occurs when the coronavirus or accident, disease, whatever, leads to a non-functional body. Medics aspire to, but are incapable of repairing, of fully, fully replicating the species typical abled body. Medical disability in COVID is thus the long-term impact that the virus have on about 70 75% of those infected. But in the 80s, 1980s, the politics of disability took a different view, engaged by contrast with capitalism's reliance upon the notion of incapable bodies and decapacitated labour is inimical to the cycle of wealth creation. The social model of disability argues, as Oliver maintains, that it's nothing to do with the body. Drawing on a Western liberal rights-based framework, social disability addresses the failure to provide social, economic, cultural and architectural access, thus placing limits upon an individual's function, appearance and affect. The challenge is to create necessary changes to a normative, non-adjusted and unfriendly world for someone impacted by long COVID to ensure that they can reattain capability, whether through the use of a wheelchair, a personal assistant to facilitate them, or through joining with other disabled people to challenge stigma. Activists have fought for disability rights bills in India and Britain to delegitimate prejudice, making discrimination illegal and laying out the frameworks for rights of access in order to bring about change in the structures and relationships of a hitherto presumed normal world. But disability rights bills always struggle for enactment against the demands of economic growth. And a multitude of questions exercise disability campaigners, especially in India and other decolonized countries. The inapplicability of disability identity and rights-based UN convention to the interrelational lives of the expanding numbers of debilitated individuals who might potentially claim disability has highlighted the problematic of framing justice through an individualist epistemology. 
Disability works as a defined and regulated disciplinary category, a stable othering of the minority self claimed largely by those who live with a degree of privilege. It's capacitated through class, color, education, work status to provide access to health, welfare and legal rights, as Puara argues. Those living insecure existences are far less likely to identify as disabled. A woman in rural Maharashtra without educational backup or a disabled persons organization to support their claiming of a benefit. If you're living a woman on a housing estate in Liverpool, depressed and having delusions, no chance. In either country, vulnerable in accommodation or in work, where an appeal to disability laws would be more likely to result in ev eviction or dismissal than support with further access needs. So we have a marked difference in experience moderated by privilege between and within the global South and North that undermines the universal appeal of the social model of disability, prompting analysis through the body from the intersectional feminist and post-colonial perspectives. Disability, Gaines, Ginsburg and Rapp argue, is profoundly relational and radically contingent interdependent on specific social and material conditions that too often exclude full participation in society. <clears throat> this approach undermines any prior existence of a stale body, the sense of a pre-given being, but looks rather to fleshy socio-cultural assemblages, networks of both the living and inorganic, interweaving together in an active process of bodily becoming. Existence for disabled people is always an interconnected affair, deeply embedded in co-creative means of adjustment, access and support through a fluid web of material, discursive and cognitive approaches to encountering the world. Whether in the home or institute, UK or India, this is largely supported by low status people paid little or nothing, time pressured, undervalued and deeply, deeply necessary. From a decolonial perspective, the eugenically marked normative body in the, is thus displaced. Inter interrelational energies and intes intensities frame an emerging politics of disability justice through the ethical questioning of the intersectional conditions of privilege. Patty Byrne um, from the state argues in uh, a co-created principles of disability justice, fabulous piece of writing, says, one cannot comprehend ableism without grasping its interrelations with heteropatriarchy, white supremacy, colonialism and capitalism. Now, debility isn't a parallel to, to disability directly, originally signaling a worn out, frail, rundown state of being. But now it's more broadly, it more broadly functions as a reminder of oncoming death, however distant, that's accelerated by poor working conditions and a consumerism that promises potentials and products creating ease. Yet the drive for their production creates further dis-ease as the Anthropocene spreads environmental disturbance. The able body, a long established part of a nationalist imaginary, is actually always already unstable. It brings reminders of abilities, temporary nature, visions of embodied disruption and the inevitable breakdown that ensures even those with apparent fit and able embodiment live with the dread of ont ontological disruption. disruption. Puar writes of the disavowal, disavowal of debility that is already present and the prognostic progression of pathology. During the pandemic, this prognostic Prognostication is particularly potent. I've been practicing that for days. The treatment of COVID has brought sick people together in interconnectivity with, in the UK, ICU workers as they negotiate complex equipment and with family. The phenomenological contact instantiates change in each body. Connections and technologies orient towards the energies of life and flows of health through the patient. Yet many who leave hospital have long COVID, a poorly understood but systemic illness that wreaks havoc, not simply upon the lungs, but through strokes, autoimmune disorders, disorders depression and anxiety. The individual 
um, family, physios, drugs and equipment are part of the web of disability support, an open network of connections linking around each one and impacting all. For those without hospital access, as for many in India, the lack of medical support services leads to networks that are radically different, with family and health workers weaving pathways of care and cure around limited technology. Lack of privilege impacts survival and needs to emergent debility. The awareness of impending frailty and to death, especially for black and minority ethnic, Dalit working class people in non-metropolitan areas, massive association with poverty. Those with access and privilege are constrained to strive for cure, despite the current unreliable state of medical knowledge. The resultant uncertainties constitute cure as a time of violence and vulnerability. It's evident also that many staff will themselves carry post-traumatic stress disorder and long-term anxiety away from their experience of COVID care, making this a time of violence for them too. That the temporality of cure for patients and health carers is simultaneously a time of emergent debility. Now the impact of COVID as ever greater numbers survive with precarious health and livelihoods is a rise in a precariat of underpaid, unpaid and forced labor and slavery. Underlying this dive into mis misery for billions, neoliberal hit theory holds that the rise to wealth at base is due to individual effort and personal qualities. The brutality of this global paradigm concentrates wealth in the hands of the few. Actions focused around the individual consumer, control is taken of the necessities of life as well as its luxuries, and wealth grafts through controlling every aspect of the supply line. Neoliberalism is both deeply imbricated with and alienated from the strategies of the seizure of the very materiality of life at the level of the individual, which it employs. It exacerbates the conditions of precarity under which the pressures of climate toxicity, economic stress and environmentally destructive cultures of the Anthropocene strive. These strategies are constituent of disability and the rise of COVID. As processes of production have intensified, spatio-temporal arrangements of shift work and irregular hours, doing demanding yet routinized jobs, have become ever more casualized, so that people pay poverty wages, tend to work exhaustively and with higher levels of contact, yet with limited or no job, job protection or PPE or sick pay. 43% of women in the UK, in a UK survey, have worked harder during the pandemic. Now, these factors are all exacerbated for migrant workers. Stress, food, poor food, bad sleep, smoking, anxiety, all prognosis pathology for cancer, ulcers, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and a whole list more. But time moves faster, space contracts. But globalization's benefits of an apparent shrinkage of space and time remain distant for those living in poverty. To them, time and space appears more crumpled than shrunk. Under these conditions, embodiment wears down. Faced by risk, impermanence and insecurity, mental as well as physical health is under threat and people effectively come to face living with dying, their bodies weakened and emotional health undermined. One further rise in threat levels, a new, more transmissible COVID variant, and life may become impossible to sustain. Yet in the society's control through which most of us now move, the linking of time, algorithms, and mapping, mapping techniques localise patterns of health, disease, birth, and death. As with the COVID geo-tracking apps designed for track, trace, and isolate programmes, they can overlay temporary spatial data onto goods production, welfare insurance and um, carceration data, acting as a newly emerging capacity debility machine that ensures governments and financial bodies continue to make money from even sick and dying minds and bodies. New needs are constantly created, demanding further technologies of production and consumption. 
Spatial thinking, whether at a global population or individual level, has laid out new concepts determining questions of belonging, fitness for labour and ideals of the proper body. This in turn impacts changing concepts of temporality and its value as work changes, um, changes form. Biodata charting neoliberal labour demands during pandemic, pandemic times is established so lockdown in control societies of India and UK can render some poten potentially productive manual and service workers idle, decapacitating them. Roles within the techno-linguistic and effective spheres are recapacitated, moved from office to home, this go ongoing work from home thing that we've got, from face to face to Zoom. Uh, restricting the domestic space and inserting productivity ever more firmly within its sphere. With increasingly prosthetized bodies, whether through mobile phones, touch sensitive laptop screens or vo voice operated domestic technologies, all bodies, not simply those of Stephen Hawkins and his ilk, can become the cyborgian self long promised. Prosthetics had been viewed as, as appropriately simply for disabled people, particularly those with functional disabilities who'd benefit from a wheelchair, an artificial limb or an artificial voice. But as we all become cyborgs, it's those with intellectual disabilities who risk being left behind as simply flesh or matter, incapable and relegated to the inv inactive, invisible sphere. As Renu Adlaka has made clear, not all such people are rejected as without work. In other places, other spaces, such as rural areas of India, they continue to produce, as is part of possibly a pre neoliberal time, contributing to household economics of use and exchange. India and Britain both have populations who are, in one sense, left behind. But de decolonial thinking may offer other prospects, and I'll come on to that. To return to the systemic inequities revealed by the pandemic in UK and India, unremarked groups most impacted by the, by the rise in neoliberalism and the growth of austerity face an imminent rise in debility and slow death. Survival rates vary widely. In the UK, the young, the fit, the slim, the white, but conversely women are the ones who survive infection the best thus far. The richest have twice the survival rates of the poorest. Whilst women suffer overall more ill health than men, they are, men are more likely to die, along with people living in poverty, which includes disabled people and those with pre-existing illness, elders, black, Asian, non-white heritage people. COVID's written us a hit list exposing the privileged normative body that has greater protection, not simply against COVID, but against bodily prejudice. When the long-term economic effects of COVID hit, women, Black, Dalit people, disabled and other disenfranchised groups all um, suffered. The economic figures are grim. Claire Wenham says, this makes COVID-19 the latest in the long line of epidemics that have brought economic precarity and rising debility in COVID-19. No, sorry, that's uh, where's my page seven gone? I've it. Hang on, I'll find it. Oh, why does all this happen? Sorry, it has disappeared. You might be glad of a little break. Everybody breathe and I'll find page seven. Take your time, Janet, no issues. Sorry? Take your time if you need to find it. It's your... all right. It's just down here. I'm sorry. It was being um, marginally altered this morning and it's clearly gone work walk about on me. And come about there. Nope. Go back up a bit. Okay. Right, here we go. I think that's it. Yeah. Um, so as I was saying, COVID's written us a, a hit list and we were looking at the economic figures. Um, so when COVID emerged, um, okay, yeah, that was my final point there, that um, I was saying the figures economically are grim. Um, 
COVID is the latest in a long line of things that has done this. So personal, personal insecurities expanded. And as personal and state finances contract, individuals are forced into both acceding to and paying for their own debilitation, whilst insecurity and precarity is itself a precipitator of slow death. When COVID immersion was acknowledged by both nations, one of the first acts was to order lockdowns. As part of lockdown, people are instructed to stay in. But the pandemic is querying many rules and behaviours. To be at risk through being out and the wrong place as lesbians, trans, queer, as Muslim, particularly with um, a non-Muslim partner as part of a love jihad, a sex worker out late at night, all out and queering. To be in with the wrong person as a young woman, as um, a lesbian or a gay man with a partner. So in, out, who says? So people negotiate around space, position, relationality, temporality. They slip across unmarked boundaries, try to orientate, or orientate themselves towards safety, are punished for the failures to comply, meet deterrence and violence. The feminist campaign of 16 Days Against Violence came during the peak of COVID this year. And in both nations, there have been widespread reports of a rise in violence against women, against disabled people, against sex workers, queer, black, Muslim, immigrant. All of the outsider groups have marked, have seen marked sparks in hate crime that the Black Lives Matter um, protests were very much in tune with. And it's not only queer people who are out, Caste, religion, race, indigeneity, disabled people all inhabit liminal spaces. To protect the home internally, the sully, to prevent the sullying of its purity, to prevent access to those unwanted spectres, literally and legally, who can be expelled from or concealed within the interstices of the dis domestic, the in institution or the national space. They become immaterial, abject, ambiguous, ambiguous, living precarious lives. As with the similarly displaced queer community, many people with disability cannot independently inhabit their own home space. The home and normative and able disabled who can perform the norm spend their pink pounds or their disabled pounds happily, crit pounds, in building their comfy nest, attending each gay pride and living their home and national and heteronormative lifestyle. Or for disabled people, if they can find a space such as the Paralympics or global activism through joining in with things like um, the British government's laughably bad um, disability link um, in 2018. Their crit nationalism presents an inspirational and exceptional face, exceptionalized face to the world, their impairment unthreatening. Such figures do find a space within capitalism's network as they strive to evade debilities in encroaching embrace. But there are those who crip the norms and work through interdependence and mutual alliance, offering a different route, very visual, visible during COVID as autonomy and independence are displaced by communality and link, linkage with people creating networks of survival and communities of support. Now lockups traditionally been a part of border control as with the lockdown instituted in Kashmir. People have been locked in through security forces, whilst conversely at borders of Britain, refugees in Europe are locked out across the channel or locked up in detention centres awaiting de deportation. Whether in, out or in transit, between those who are, fo are the focus of incarceration, um, they suffer a vulnerable to debility and violence. And the associated map micro practices are an expression of state power and social power. Um, it's always already experienced by many disabled people, particularly those with noticeable psychosocial disabilities and with disruptive cognitive and neuroatypical impairments who risk institutional imprisonment, often with few rights or who face expulsion from their communities and homes, ending up homeless or in sex work. 
The pandemic has seen writers reaching for forever more excessive descriptive terms to emphasize the extent of inequality, death, and social and economic destruction that's evolving in its wake. We've entered a period where bioprecarity is evident all around us, affecting each of us in different ways, but now a reality that few would dare to dismiss. Margaret Childrick theorizes that bioprecarity goes beyond the economic understanding of precarity on its own, which is now in common usage to describe the situation faced by those for whom neoliberalism has failed to deliver its promised rewards. Rather, it incorporates the embodied individual, with Shildrick pr pr proposing that bioprecarity has, I quote, come to signify not only an empirical category, but something more akin to an ontological state. Whilst closely aligned with disability, both terms highlight the corporeal, affective and cognitive vulnerabilities that now are now a universal possibility, a state anticipated anticipated by many, if not already lived with. The revelation of underlying inequities predicated on austerity, math bond to bioprecarity. Puar argue, argues of black embodiment um, that racialized bodies are expected to endure pain, suffering and injury. And in a, opposition to white frig, fragility, they are they're at a higher likelihood of disability. This apparent biopolitical risk bears little, if any, link to biology, but it's constituted rather by racism, casteism, overcrowding and re relative poverty. Now, I would like to go on to a final section now, and I'm going to use at some stage during this a few PowerPoint slides. It offers some thoughts on living in COVID time and theories and practices that may help us through. Disability rights activism has taken hold of the conditions of discrimination and prejudice and challenges them, aiming to alter the norms of culture and of the material structures of existence to enable new ways of being and create new structures that create space for disability. Crip activism, however, has no such expectation. At a time when cyborg forms and hybrid materialities are multiplying, Liz Gross proposes that we look to how both the world and body are opened up for redistribution, disorganization and transformation. Each is metamorphosed in the encounter, both becoming something other, something incapable of being determined in advance and perhaps even in retrospect but which nonetheless are perceptibly shifted and re realigned. Janet, it's let us know when you want us to share the um, PowerPoint. PowerPoints. It's in about two paragraphs. Okay. Okay. It's in these realignments that we find the pot potentials for change, for a move towards justice, lurking around the edges of its own exclusion, Crip queer actively haunts the apparently normative existence within heteropatriarchy and compulsory able-bodiedness. In contrast to disability rights approaches, to make possible a Crip queer future of becoming requires parody, undermining, disruption. Katrina, Katalina Kolorova says, in Crip queer, it, sorry, in Crip queer, Critique. Failure can be seen not as a consequence of individual debility, but as a condition of possibility for thinking alternative forms of sociality, communality and flourishing. Such failure speaks to the potentials of new in interconnectivities and alliances that are opened up by the cripping and queering of ideas, displacing unity with hybridity, conviction with uncertainty, sterile su success with productive failure. There's a remaking not just of ideas, but of actions and of affect, perceiving afresh the importance of fair trade emotional economies and what Mia Mingus calls access intimacy. The compulsion is to work together with the sense of collective endeavor for community-based resource sharing and mutual aid alliances of care and support. Many established by quick Crip queer, black, indigenous and people of colour. They come together in pursuit, not simply of survival, but of justice, 
of a queer movement and moment that will embrace and celebrate the instability, diversity, failure and vulnerability of embodiment and a world opened by disability and disability to creativity and intimacy. Can I have slide one, please? It's here that we see some of the crip queer demands for emergency COVID-19 survival. For free healthcare, no work if it endangers people, no rent so that they can survive in their homes and not be evicted, no debt so that they emerge at the end without um, heavy loads of repayments, and that prisoners who are at the highest or very high risk of COVID should be freed and that there should be homes for all. This from a disability justice network of the world's richest economy. Many people are on the streets without support, without health care. So in the next slide, we see Romilly Alice Walden's providing a manifesto for COVID time. What you see is an image from the following quote that was published in Crip magazine. It's on oblongs of brownie orange backing with varying size scripts, crossing outs and capital letters for emphasis. She says, a queer crip future grows in the underlands, the wastelands and the fallow lands, out of sight and out of mind, rooting, spawning, germinating under the soil in that moist and fecund undergrowth where, where we have been forgotten. We wait here, growing and shifting, leaking and mutating, fucking and decaying in the wastelands of the sick. We are breeding, building up our strength in numbers. What a threat. So PowerPoint three. Now I want to look at some particular pieces of art that have been created during this time as alternative translations of the world, teasing out different meanings. As part of Dada Fest International um, 19, oh, 2020, um, joined by FACT in Liverpool, three queer women, an audio describer and two crip, crip women, a performer and a photographer, worked to investigate and reframe the rep representation of Tammy, who's a small woman performer, and you see her here. They created a website, Reform, containing images of her and her words used to describe the images, which were spoken by Dot, the audio describer. In a podcast, they, they address the choice of words used, which, which, why, and who decided. Their work looks at accessibility, not just as a basic right, but as a radical creative practice. And the podcast of this is fascinating if you have time to listen. The image shows Tammy on the left hand side in three small profiles and in the centre is an image about which Tammy says, I'm sat on the floor, a tight close up of my torso, arms and face. I'm a white female with dwarfism. I have curly brown hair, a tousled strand falling in front of my face. I'm wearing a strappy black dress embellished with sheer fabric. I'm looking down at my left arm my right hand pointing towards it, the soft, gentle folds of my skin creating light shadows. I have a small tattoo of a sausage dog on my inner forearm, a simple black outline design that you may recognize as Picasso. Now the three women discussed issues such as words for her size, dwarf, she will permit others to use, only she is allowed to use the term midget. So I quote here, as a midget, Tammy, is used to non-consensual documentation from the general public. As a crypt photographer, Natalia is used to barriers put in the way by non-disabled for her to make work. Let's stop doing that, shall we? This is what happens when crypts have control of the gray gaze, control of the process, and I don't know, control of something too, something else too, end quote. Definitely a work you should look at. Rising Flame, the DPO's name, the Disabled Person Organization's name, is written below this representation on the next slide of a phoenix facing upwards, its head looking towards the right. Its wings are spread like flames around it in layers from bright red to pale, pale orange. Based in Mumbai, this is an organization that works across rural and urban areas online and with a focus on women with disabilities and with marginalized disabled people such as youth, those in poverty, 
queer people, LGBTQO, and lower caste. It's made a focus of enabling people with disability to tell their own stories, to share their own experiences, disrupting inter interpretations by outside experts. They offer a flexible productivity that embraces the inherent instabilities and vulnerabilities of the embodied self in telling not just personal stories, but for example, women's rewritings of fairy tales. In the center of the image, you see a book cover titled My Tale Too, which sits showing irregular patches of bright red, blue and yellow powder. And underneath it says, Rising Flame, uh, Rising for the Rights of Girls and Women with Disabilities, produced by Rising Flame and One Billion Rising. Now, Mia Mingus, the disability justice activist, writes of how crucial it is to tell one's own stories, how vital that there are people able to hold and understand them. These women also have stories of violence told during the 16 days of protest, and they have stories of sexuality told in a book produced with point of view. So you have a wide range of women's experiences of life, sexuality, really their own stories in their own words. This next PowerPoint shows a deaf organization in the UK produced through a set of short signed videos. Um, they were produced again for Dada Fest in 2020. Their black logo shown top right is a bar with the lightning jack underneath and that says Dada Fest. And it's the image I'm showing is a video outtake from Permission to Speak Day 2 video speaking about the inaccuracies of translation across culture, sexuality and community for deaf people. We see a black man with short hair sitting. He's got on a white button collar t-shirt and a black, grey and yellow check jacket. His right fist is bent towards the user, it bent, bent towards the user. And he's showing signs of how gay deaf culture is misrepresented by sign interpreters. It's a very funny piece. Below him, it says, so these are some signs, uh, uh, and this, those are the interpreter's words. The very next section is a clip of a woman berating the interpreter for mistranslation. Well, I'm not sure whether I put the PowerPoint slide for that in there. But so you get this reinterpretation, misinterpretation, and just a very clear sense of how there are many different languages within sign, not just one, even within for example, British Sign Language, and the ways in which it can be queered by the retranslation of mistranslation. So in this final piece, we see some community res responsive art by Reshma Valyapan, who runs Merchants of Madness festivals um, for mad people. And she also runs a Red Door Mental Health Support Group for, from Pune. This is a representation of the goddess Kumunda Devi. It's display, displayed on a canvas roll, 1.6 by 10 metres, which is unrolled down the side of a building co-op flat, shown, showing in this image. The cosmic egg, Brahmanda, is at the start of the journey of creation called shared consciousness. And beside this, we see the goddess herself, many limbed and green on a yellow orange background. So all of this varied work, and there is much, much, much more of it, so, so much creativity oozing out there, aims to help us reach across spaces of difference, to speak through the thickness of silence, to translate and reinterpret against the grain, um, and to decolonize the world through which COVID has led us. The pandemic has made ever more visible the valences of differential embodiment, the often contradictory language and the very different memories attached to the orientations of bodies in time and space across cultures and geographies. Disability, debility, compulsory able-bodiedness and ableism have been made manifest during the pandemic in ways that have, that have revealed the continuing gulf and the points of sameness between people across gender, class, race, caste, culture, culture, sexuality, religion, between India and the UK, global South and North, in the trajectories of disability theorizing and the materialities of disabled existence. Success is uncertain. Crip life is full of obstacles and contradictions that arise and can serve as our most creative resource. 
the wild and boundless struggle for disability justice is a call to love. Just finally, um, I'd like to pay tribute to some of the people who have been um, around and in my life as I have um, created this writing. So in my head, it's very much a co-creation, although they take no responsibility for the words. I'd like to thank really three disabled women, um, all thinkers and activists. Um, Anita Guy, who's a prof there in Delhi, um, for introducing me to thinking about feminism and disability, to Renu Adlaka, who I've had the pleasure of writing with and who's really stimulated me to think about um, a whole range of issues around sexuality and disability, and to Nidhi Goyal, who's been a great activist and ad advocate for women with disabilities during the pandemic. I'd like to pay a great tribute to the um, continuingly and never wavering feminist um, feminist movement in India um, and the global inspiration it spreads um, and to the people who create art from within that including my friend and hopefully future art colleague Shiba Chachi and I'd like to thank you Mary and all of you at CWDS um, for giving me the opportunity to share some very exploratory thoughts because they really are about the way that COVID has affected our, our life on this very precious planet of ours and new directions in which it may leave us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Janet, for a really marvelous, moving, stimulating presentation. Um, I think in my mind, at least all your uh, thoughts are swirling around. It'll take a while, I think, for me to put it all as an orchestration of, um, of concerns, of histories, of comparative spaces, the UK and India. Um, you know, you gave us colonialism and you gave us the present all in, you know, less than an hour. So um, really, really thankful for that. Um, I now open it up for discussion. We have time for questions. It can either take the form of um, putting your question into the chat. Uh, there's a chat at the bottom of the screen. Uh, so if you, um, right now there are many thank yous coming from the chat box to you, uh, Janet, from Unmul Khair and from Aklak um, and from Niluka, uh, thank yous. Uh, so if you wish to sort of raise a question through the chat box, please feel free to do that. Otherwise, you can unmute yourself uh, and ask it verbally. And uh, Janet, I think, will respond. Or not. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the power of connection. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Oh dear, have I reduced everybody to silence. <laughs> this is, it is Vasanthi very- Vasanthi has a question. Vasanthi oh. Rahul, our current chairperson, I think would like okay. to ask you a question. Vasanthi, please, uh, go ahead. You know, I would like to say that I'm, I really am speechless and I do not have questions, but uh, I'm totally overwhelmed by this presentation. And I would like to suggest whether we can have a copy of her presentation, which will be available to us because it's, there's so much to digest in this that we would definitely like this. And I'm sure CWDS can consider uh, probably uh, yes. putting it online or, uh, or having a, a paper made out of it. Mm. Thank you. I'll, um, I need to tidy it up a little bit and finish doing the references, but um, very, very much, you know, very happy to share it because I love, um, really love to develop some of these ideas. And I need, you know, as with all ideas, that only helps with um, interrelationships. You, you need other people. That, that paper was the, um, you know, just a combination of many years of varied links with colleagues talking about ideas and building up a whole background of, of thinking in 
very different and often seemingly unconnected areas. So, but thank you. Thank you, Asanti. Uh, if I may, uh, Janet, um, you mentioned, you know, um, all of us are new are learners in the field of disability. And to me, the most amazing thing is that you made this a lens for looking at the world, not mm -hmm. a lens for thinking about the specificity of being visually or auditorily or in, you know, other forms physically or mentally disabled, because we, we constantly end up making this mistake that we uh, mark the problem by virtue of the individual who embodies the problem. What you have done is to completely displace that and actually view the world through the lens of disability. Uh, mm -hmm. And if anything, you've, abnorm you've made abnormal the creation of the ideal able-bodied person. I mean, you've turned it upside down as it were. Um, but within your, your thinking, you know, one of the, you know, the ABCs that we all read about is this whole question of the social versus the biological. Mm -hmm. And I heard you um, querying perhaps the political correctness of the social, mm -hmm. which, we have, which has been used to uh, question biomedical modes of thinking. Um, but I, if I, I mean, again, as, as Vasanti said, it will take us time to take in all the things you said, but it did seem like you were raising a question mark about this, um, the, the standard framing of the social. And I was wondering if you'd like to say a little more about that. Yes, yeah, certainly. I think it's, it's very interesting with the social because the, you know, the comment by Mike Oliver that I quoted about um, disability being nothing to do with the body that comes from the social model, but really trying to, to push the understanding of it out into the world and saying, you know, because we have this notion of a normative body, we create our world to suit that body. And actually, most people don't have normative bodies. I mean, to the very basic level, you might be six foot, six, four tall, or you might be three foot tall. And um, the same contexts are not going to su suit you. So you have to rethink through what works within the world. Um, I think what began to happen was that feminists began to say the body needs to be part of our disability thinking, not because um, we're not trying to think about how the world responds to disabled people, but because we also need to recognize the body as encultured. Our body is not just given, but our body is created by the world through which we move. So for example, a person who is rehabilitating from a stroke, depending upon the social context of their world, they may be put into a wheelchair and left there forever, or they may be given intensive physiotherapy and crutches and, um, lots of work to do and lots of support to do it, and they get back to walking again. Now they've got the same biological or same embodied potential, but the outcomes are very different. So we have a world which creates our bodies, our bodies aren't just given to us. And I think what's happened with the, the thinking about um, the way in which the social model and particularly the UN Convention for People with Disabilities is problematic, is that because it has this very um, singular model that there are um, there is one way of being disabled in effect, and that's or there is one way of claiming rights for being disabled. So um, you are set it separating out a whole group of people who can claim, and I think as um, Jasbir Pua particularly argues very powerfully that that capacity to claim disability is so much structured by privilege. Mm -hmm. So with my, with my multiple sclerosis, which is very indeterminate in its presentation, if I was living in severe poverty, for me to claim the level of benefits I receive at the moment would um, involve, I mean, it involves having actually a very high level of involvement with the way that the forms are written, with the absolutely precise language you have to use for the claiming, um, with the um, 
ways in which you are enabled or disabled by the medical people around you, by the social context around you. There's a whole series of things that make it possible or not possible to make these claims for disability benefits or even make the claim to be disabled yourself. And for lots of people, that is not possible. There's all of these new defined um, illnesses or disabilities emerging, a lot of them psychosocial, mental health related, many of them physical, things like fibromyalgia, which causes you know, endless pain um, and real difficulties in moving, um, deep levels of fatigue. For a long time, it's just been dismissed as a nothing. And now they're beginning to think there's actually a reality to many of these autoimmune diseases. So there's this question of, you know, you actually need a sign off by the medics to determine your disability before you can claim it from a social space. And yet for many people, there is not that possibility and never will be because of the poverty, lack of privilege, lack of experience. So you've got this, this constant tension. And I think the argument is that we need to start looking much more to the way that disability is created by the interrelationships around us, by the worlds through which we move, whether you live in um, a small village in India where okay, you may have um, a level of intellectual <laughs> disability, but you are supported and given jobs to do that meet your level of capacity and you're a very fully integrated part of that community. Or you live in a, um, you know, a rich home down in, in the south of England and you're sent to the best special separate schools for children with intellectual disability and those are the only people you ever meet apart from your family and your life is deeply unproductive, very isolated and, and actually very lonely. So it's, it's so much context, relationships, area. and I think, you know, one of the big arguments from Southern feminists is that we need to really begin to look at these relationships within disability, the ways that the um, interrelationships and the phenomenological encounters that we have with others shapes who and how we can be in the world. Um, so it's not, it's not throwing out the social model. It's not saying all those arguments about access are wrong. It's saying we need to build beyond it and think further into different ways of being. So I, I think it's not saying all that all that is, it's not looking for the rights and wrongs, it's looking for ways of moving forward into recognition of, of a changing world, really. Um, Mary, can I ask a question? Please, Reno. Yeah, uh, Janet, phenomenal, mesmerizing presentation, Hi. as Thank always, you. loved Thank it. You. Um, and I really enjoyed uh, writing with you also. So, you know, I have both the experience of Janet as a presenter and Janet as a co-writer. It was uh, very enjoyable. Yeah. Well, um, actually, yeah. what I wanted to ask was, could you tell us a little bit about how debility, the concept of debilities, has entered the discourse around ability, uh, around disability and disabledism and able-bodiedness? Because mm -hmm. I'm a bit uh, confused. I mean, I've read uh, Justit Poir, but could you kind of, uh, from your point of view, kind of explicate on it in a bit, both in terms of its connection with disability and how do you see it in the current, uh, in uh, as as a as a kind of conceptual framework for understanding uh, what can only be called a, a embodied difference? Hmm. I think it's still very much an evolving concept, Renu, and I think it's one of those things that's floating around and is used a lot, but people are still quite uncertain about how it can be pinned down. Um, my understanding, and I'm, I may not have this completely right, is that um, Julia Livingston, who works in um, different parts of Africa, had done a lot of work over years um, again, looking at the way that the notion of disability did not work for many in communities that she was working with. They, um, they didn't want to claim it for a lot of the stigma associated with it. Um, some of them saw disability, um, for example, amputations gained as a result of their fighting during um, 
anti-colonial wars. They saw them as a source of pride, not a source of shame. So that labelling of something that brought shame was, was completely inappropriate in their view. And yet they were dealing, living with on a day-to-day -day basis, something that brought them distress, pain, tiredness, um, and that um, for many people wound through this cycle of both your change in your body leading to poverty and the poverty leading to change in your body. And the way, and I think that leads on to the way in which debility has been increasingly tied up with notions of neoliberal productivity, particularly, um, that we've moved beyond a sort of um, previous capitalist ideas, which were um, much more restricted to, I, I think the social model very much came at a t up at a time when they were thinking about um, conveyor belts and the bodies that fitted into them and using that as a sort of model in, in some simplistic way. I mean, I don't think the thinking was simplistic, but I think that's how very much of the thinking has, has moved forward. And I think because neoliberalism has put so many people, we've got so many migrant um, wage laborers, we've got you know, women who are working endless hours in homes, pretty much doing slave labor as domestic workers. We've got people um, in the UK working on zero hour contracts, caring for elderly people and other disabled people and becoming more and more tired, more and more anxious, more and more depressed. Um, you know, who, if they lived within a context privilege would be able to stop say my psychosocial state is such that I um, can start to take um, antidepressants I I've got so much pain I can stop working I can label this as something for which I could claim support um, and so that that sort of naming so I think for me the concept of debility because it's so tied up with privilege and with this, um, the ways in which our bodies are, are capacitated or decapacitated through the economic system. Um, I think I view it as something that is helpful in actually making us think, not, not throw disability out because it's an enormously important concept, but to really carefully think about what the contexts of privilege are that enable it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that maybe we haven't been sufficiently aware of, that it's been used as a descriptive term, but actually it's an identity term. It's something people claim for themselves. Um, and I think rather than putting it as a label onto people, maybe, you know, this is where we get into this confusion because the UN, you know, the UN labeling, counts up the number of people with particular types of um, incapacities, both because of social um, access and because of bodily change and puts it all together and produces a number and says these are the disabled people in the world. Um, so that's one approach. Then you've got the disability activists who claim and I'm one of those who, who claim it as a point of pride because I think there are enormously important issues to be fought about but it does demand that we start to really think about where our points of of exclusion within the disability community come from and how we create and set those up um, and in that way, I think it's very useful terminology just to remind us of that and to remind us to really think about, you know, which bodies are being set up for maiming, which bodies are being structured for damage, for violence, for, um, for harm without any potential of resource or recourse to... Um, Yes, resources for survival under duress, I think, um, is what um, Sedgwick said. And I think it's a it's a very useful thing to think about, you know, where do those where do you look when you're under duress? What are your points of, of um, coping? 
and disability, that labeling of a disability identity for many is, is not a potentially um, useful one. And I think we need to think about why that is and what we can do to maybe make that a more expansive possibility. Does that go any way to? Yeah, no, thank you. I mean, I, I just thought that debility, you know, I mean, the way I understood it and you seem to be kind of, uh, I seem to be uh, kind of agreeing with what you're saying, but it also comes that it's a, it's a concept that can be transplanted into the experiential realm in other domains. For example, you know, middle-aged women who are, you know, out of work and who don't, who are stuck with housework and, you know, are very boring and uh, uh, very, um, sort of uh, disappointing life, you know, and then how many of the things they may say, it's not disability, it's maybe debility. I don't know. You know, it's also a yeah. concept that one can work with. That's what I was... I, th I think absolutely. And I think um, it's, that, it's that looking... I think you're absolutely right. The conditions of possibility is precisely what it revolves around, what, what the possibilities are for individuals and the ways in which they can be very trapped. I mean, you know, that sort of locked in, locked down, locked out mm, yeah. type of message. Where are the boundaries that actually um, they, they cannot escape from? And what are the possibilities for, for shifting that? Mm, uh, interesting conversation, though, and I'd be happy to sort of, I'd really like to continue it because I think it's... Yeah. Um, it's with one that we need to um, explore much more and really think about the the potentials, limits, the the yes, the um, yeah, where we can t where we can take it and what we can do with it. I think yeah. it's is always the question, isn't it? Yeah, we'll take take it forward Rajini, later. Please go ahead, Rajini. Yeah. Um, first of all, thank you for everyone. Can't hear you, Rajini. Your voice is not clear. <laughs> Can't hear. Um, is it better now? Yes. Yes. Is it now? Okay. I've sort of poked my head right into my computer. So the thing is, uh, I was just saying thank you. And my connection is very unstable. So I missed a lot of, I think, just at various points when you got to something which I really wanted to hear, I missed out. But Renu's asked a question which was, I was thinking about in some ways not being somebody who's really looked close, you know, uh, looked at disability the way you and Renu and all have done. But when I was listening to your response about the distinction between disability and debility, I was just wondering that in a sense, it becomes such an expansive term, debility. How do we get purchase on it? How do we carve out uh, the different fields, are we then sort of, okay, if not the 99%, it's like the 90% or the 80%. And how is that going to be productive? This is what I'm not being able to get my head around. I mean, I like the idea because in a certain sense, you know, disability seems so much it's there and it's not there. Whereas debility allows for a fluidity which is maybe much more true to life, but then have we covered, as I said, the 99%? How, do, how is that going to be made productive? I, th I think you're right. I think that the, um, that the shame for all of us is that it is, it, it is such an all-encompassing term. It covers so many, um, so many people in the world we live who, um, whose lives are ones of, of debility, that they are not ones of possibility. Um, and I think for me, maybe where the, um, the, the markers come is to think through debility is, it's not just a, a generic, yes, it's a wearing down of the body, but to think very specifically, what are the particular markers of debility within, say, a group of Dalit women. How would you understand that? How would you understand the very particular workers of, um, of the market, of stigma, of lack of access, of how those weave around and limit them, how they change their body, how they change their comportment, how they change their potential, and 
really think through the um, put those within to within and look at how that weaves through to very particular sets of possibly illnesses, possibly um, practical disabilities um, that you could labor if you're going to take a, um, that, you know, or certainly impairments, which is the term that they use within the social model, the, the ways in which the body is changed. So I think maybe to, to look much more, I mean, just be poor when she's, she's using the term, she looks very specifically at the context between, um, for the um, Palestinians and what has happened to their bodies. You know, so she's weaving it around a very particular group of individuals and understanding it for them. So I think we have to make, we have to build these particularities within certain contexts, certain um, temporospatial settings, within certain social groupings, and understand much more clearly. Because then we are looking, if we can understand more clearly, we're then looking at more. Um, I, it seems to me we then begin to create possibilities of change, particularly because it's very much an interrelated concept, which is looking at um, the ways in which connections between people are built. This isn't simply, a, um, you know, individual people, but it's about connectivity. And with connectivity, comes the possibility for resistance, for pushback, for support, for alliance, um, all of those things. So I think it becomes much more than simply an individual figure looking from within their own ontological setting, but something about recognizing that it's about um, individual bodies in the process of becoming and what that becoming will be together rather than solo. So I think we're, we're really using it as, or you can use it as very much a, um, a way of talking about social change, but which encompasses the full physicality of an individual, um, as well as the social conditions through which they move. So you're really getting at that, you know, the pain they feel in their back after a day's work in the field, or you know, the way that when shame or, or stigma hit, hits them, that it makes that heavy weight sit in their stomach. And what does that do to their experience of living? And how could that potentially propel the possibilities of change? Does that, does that, I don't know, I'm just exploring where this might go myself. So I'm, I mean, I was really sort of thinking through as I was talking to you and what might this mean? But I think for me within, within disability politics, it's meant very much thinking much more about the instabilities of my own body and that in recognizing that instability, I have created for myself many more possibilities for activism and joining with, with others. It's interesting that you would think if you knew much more stably where things would go, but actually the instability leads to more possibility. What was striking me is also in listening to you that maybe it's a way to get louder, Rajni. We can't hear you. Sorry, yes, I again have to go into my. Sorry, yes, you have to put your nose on it. Yeah. <laughs> oh God, I'm sorry. There's this uh, the internet man is trying to now call me because I've been complaining. <laughs> um, what I was just thinking, listening to you, what it also seems to suggest that you can get to the re relationality of the sort of condition, the situation more easily, perhaps? I don't know. Um, I don't know whether you get there more easily, but I think it brings it into focus. It says this has to be a part of your thinking. You cannot think about this in an individualist way. It has to be much more of a relational thing, thought process and an understanding of how people change together. So then if we may add to that, where would we then be now? We, for instance, we have um, a liberal politics that recognizes forms of, we have the category PWD, 
Um, mm -hmm. In recent years, we have implemented in our, in our university spaces as mm -hmm. a consequence of which we have people with identifiable, a small subset, no doubt, mm -hmm. tiny subset of people with disabilities who are entering our uh, spaces are our students, mm -hmm. our faculty, in the name of in in in, in the name of this liberal politics of ex inclusion. Mm -hmm. So, where would that be today? In the in in light of what you are saying, what is our strategic relationship to this particular politics of inclusion? Right. Um, well, you start from. Um, I mean, if I was going there, I wouldn't start from here. Is the sort of thing you say, isn't it? Um, I think it would be a very different thinking about architecture, about um, labels, about um, about who who we see our potential student bodies as being, mm. and 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 I think actually having said that, it's student bodies as disembodied being, as well as that broad grouping of who comes to us. Um, that I hear so many um, people who are within that, ex you know, what you would see as the excluded minority discussing and learning and teaching together. There's a whole process of co-learning that is deeply creative and produces very... Um, very challenging and radically different ideas. So I think there's, you know, within, within an institutional space, you can go, you can start to challenge the notion of what your, um, how your institution is structured around a normate body. You can shove that you know, you can push that idea of the standard able body a bit to the side and start to think about creating for something much more, much, very different. For example, I mean, it's not a university, it's a theatre space, but um, I've been to quite a number of performances, really, that um, have had casual seating. So, and what that's involved is that, as well as the normal seating, there's been space for beanbags on the floor, there's plenty of space for wheelchairs, for people's crutches, they're not seen as impediments that get in the way of people or fire risks or whatever, they're seen as, you know, integral parts of the setting. You have um, people will come who maybe um, have things like... Um, you know, they have ticks, so they they shout in the middle of a performance. And, you know, the standard group response is that the, the audience goes, tut, 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 could you please throw that person out because they're disturbing my experience. And the response here would be, that's really interesting. That tick makes me, that, that shouting has made me experience that piece of language quite differently. How does it make me re-see you know Samuel Beckett's framing of this play um you know so it it's seeing those things as something that add to and build our experience of being in the world together rather than as a group who we have to make special arrangements for because they are particular a lot of the arrangements you make for disabled people suit us all you know you get a much greater range of seating styles you get um, you get more space, you get, I mean, for example, um, a lecture series I would have set up with lots of gaps in it. So I could have gone for a pee, people could have taken a breath, you know, they could have gone and got, you know, a cup of coffee if they needed, um, you know, so it's, it's all, it's those, yes, again, it's that there's temporary special, spatial settings that have become so ingrained into how all of our structures are built, that they're very, very difficult to break out from. So you just have to nibble at the edges wherever you can find the space and see what it produces. And sometimes what it produces can be incredibly exciting. And then you take the energy and you run with it. Okay. And sometimes it can be a failure. And that's also very interesting because that can produce different types of um types of responses, different types of, of possibilities. And I think this is all about 
doing things that produce possibility and not necessarily, I mean, it, it's like Colorovo was saying about failure, that failure produces possibility. And so it's sort of shifting thinking. It becomes, it's, it's quite scary because it doesn't give you that same nice neat list of, you know, will you do A and B and C and that produces a, either a success or a failure and you take that and then you move on to the next one. You've got something that has much less structure and much more creativity and much more, more possibility of everything going up in flames. Um, but, you know, it's going to anyway. So let's see what we can bring that will make people's experience of the world a better place and that will make the world a better place. There's a, might... a comment in the chat box for you, um, uh, Janet, from Niluka Gunavardena. And she says, uh, the ability enables us to move beyond percentages and numbers and enables us to explore our shared vulnerability, mortality. It awakens us to our ontological precarity. Mm, I think so. And I think that sense of vulnerability is a really important part of this debate, you know, to, to actually allow ourselves to be vulnerable and to see where that takes us, you know, to take away, you know, actually I haven't thought about it, but again, it's about those, those layers, those boundaries we put between ourselves and others and what happens if we take those down. So, any more? <laughs> Anyone would like to ask, um, you know, it's, I'm sure you're a little tired now, Janet, it's been... Yes, I'm trying to think whether it's, great. if I was there, yes, <laughs> if I was with you, it would be whiskey time, which would be lovely, but unfortunately <laughs> it's coffee time here, so I'll probably have to go with that. Could I ask? Nilika would oh, like please. to ask a question. Yeah. Please, yeah. Yeah. Janet, Janet, it was very interesting, very fascinating Thank presentation. You. Uh, you know, I have, uh, I think uh, it's still sinking in, uh, but I uh, was thinking that, you know, you, uh, first part, uh, I missed a bit, you know, few minutes, I uh, around 20 minutes I missed, yeah. but I think you were talking about materiality, and then you moved yeah. to a uh, queer crip uh, 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 perspective on looking at socialities and and then ended with uh, an aesthetic, uh, you know, creative uh, perspective. Yeah. And uh, I was just wondering that, you know, um, when you speak so much about fluidity, nebulousness of mm. socialities and relationalities, where does it leave us in terms of, you know, the materialities? how does uh, a, say a disabled community you know deal with the state in this uh, kind of you know uh, context where uh, for the state to exist you know it requires certain kind of uh, you know stability or uh, in more sociological terms a normal uh, more institutionalized form of being uh, which would respond to differential you know um, needs and requirements and uh, uh, and also you know the the kind of protest that we we have seen across uh, mm -hmm. the context comparative context so in this uh, you know debility definitely you know um, gives us a broader conception of looking at um, vulnerabilities nevertheless i think uh, in the alternatives i'm still i think uh, wondering how to figure out uh, dealing with more institutionalized structures, you know, and uh, how does that translate into real life? Yeah, you along with, with many of us, Nilika, I think it's a real, I think it's an incredibly complex dynamic to, to manage because on the one hand, there are these possibilities of change and that you can create, you know, if you look at the work, for example, that the Disability Justice Collective in the United States is doing, and I um, there's a link to it in, in one of the references, they have these wonderful um, alliances of mutuality, which are, um, 
you know, where they have shared support and care. I mean, there's one, one colleague I know who for about 10 years has lived. She has very, um, very clear needs of, of dependency in traditional disability terms, but she manages those through a network of friends to whom she contributes and who contribute to her by maybe helping her get dressed or, um, you know, cleaning her sex toys or, you know, the range of possibilities of what they do for her are multiple and myriad. Um, so there's those very small types of experiments in a sense. But then, as you say, you've got these big state structures, which I am only too well aware of having to negotiate because I, I do it every two years when I fill out another 40 page form about my own disabilities and my need for support. And every time I do that, what I am deeply aware of is that I do it and I achieve support because I have the privilege of education, being middle class, having um, access to a good computer links, so I can download the material that will help, and I can turn to the support groups who will tell me, if I was a woman living 10 minutes from where I live, in poverty in Liverpool, I can't afford the computer link, so I can't get online to do that. I, You know, it's that, it's that difference of recognizing that those state supports are very important, but they are so limited in terms of who they reach out to and they actually really miss all the people who most need them. And that's what, that's where I think there is such a need for shift. Um, and I'm not, you know, protest I love, you know, one of my favorite is where all the wheelchair users went out and have looked themselves together and the police arrested lots of them but they didn't have accessible police vans to put them into to wheel their wheelchairs into accessible cells to keep them into or accessible courts to try them in so it was all a bit of a you know it's like the state can attempt to function but actually the state itself has failed in many of those basics so you get this this constant tension. So what do we do? Do we campaign for the state to get accessible courts and accessible police vans for our next protests? Um, I, think, I think those campaigns, the campaigns for legal rights are always going to be there because that is a recognition of how our states currently function. And that is the way that disabled people can currently acquire support and that will not stop being important and we need to continue for that to be much more widespread and to stop the consequences of austerity which has been a, a, a massive um, undermining of those levels of support internationally globally I mean every country I know that has been reduced so we need to be looking at that but at the same time, we always, always have to be looking at possibilities for other things because our life is not simply about state support. Yeah. Our, our, our lives are so much more. But it's it's recognising it's all, we can say, oh, well, it's really important to have the state support because those most in need require it. But actually those most in need don't get it anyway because they can't access it. I know it's precisely the same in India. You know, a woman with a severe disability, but who lives, you know, in the middle of Himachal Pradesh with, you know, really poor roads. Um, she won't get a decent wheelchair that will get her around the, the tracks there. She will never get to, or very rarely will get to um, one of the towns, like, you know, where she can actually put it in her claim to, you know, one of the local social workers she will never find the disability group locally who could support her you know the it's such a thin and sparse laying out of those potentials or for a young young disabled woman wanting to go to school you know no accessible toilets and what does she do when she has a period the real practicalities of those things do not stop being absolutely vital to our survival in this world and and they need to be you know, we need to ongoingly fight for them, but I think to fight with an awareness that these are, these will have a much, much wider impact. We, we need to broaden the possibilities of who, who are um, 
the dynamics of our, our protest movements, maybe, that we narrow them down too much. We're, we're too limited in how we see them. And maybe, maybe that's one of the things we need to be much more intersectional. We, you know, what happens if you put, you know, um, a group of Dalits protesting and a group of disabled people protesting together, a group of sex workers and disabled people, a group of trans and disabled people, you will find that they have so many things in common once they actually start talking and then something happens. But we are very, we're very scared of creating those possibilities for engagement. I, I don't know. I mean, what do, what do you think? Does that... I think uh, reimagination of politics and uh, also the state, I think, is a possibility in the aesthetic approach. I think that uh, that has to be communicated at different levels, mm. you know, both to the community and to the state institutions. I think th this communication also has to go on. Yeah. Yes, mm. I, th I think so. Because I think so many people in, in, in state and bureaucratic things are actually, you know, they, they are deeply debilitated by the work that they're do, doing, you know, it's, it wears you down doing a lot of that sort of stuff, because it is intensely bureaucratic, it's not exciting and challenging 99% of the time, you know, you get the 1% of the week when you get some possibility and the rest is just hard grind, so it's trying to again shift dynamics so I suppose I, I'm just saying we're always looking for those those niches those moments of possibility where you can push for things shift this is not I mean I, I it's rare we're going to get the massive revolutions but what we can get is small moments of possibility for change thank you I'd like the revolution but you know and we need the protest just for our own energy, if nothing else. Yeah. On that note, um, very, I think, profound note, um, if there aren't other questions, uh, I'd like to say a big, big thank you, Janet. Um, a big thank you to Pinky and Preeti mm, for indeed. having given us another level of communication. Uh, to Sundaresh and Aklak for having been there in that invisible mode in which we only allow our support staff to function. Um, and to all of you in your black boxes and those of you who also asked questions. Um, thanks so much. And Janet, this has been, and thank you, Renu, for the connect because I didn't know of your work earlier. And I think we are going to, I'm going to ask Vasanti's question too, which is, Mm. Can you share with some of us, because I think it would help us to read, those of mm. us who read, uh, need time to, to, yeah. to help us think with you. Um, yes. And it's, it's hard to sort of, you know, absorb in one, in one sitting. And, yeah. and you didn't let us have any breaks. So, Absolutely. I'd be delighted to. Give me a couple of weeks to just tidy it up enough so that I'm, I'm happy to share it. And then with pleasure. I'd be delighted and please responses. I mean, the discussion has made me think about all sorts of other things. So always, um, always productive. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Thank you all. Um, and we hope to have another, uh, the fifth uh, speaker, hopefully will be Jennifer Nash, which will be an interesting follow up to Janet because it's going to be around a critical take on intersectionality. So um, please do join us again in, a, in, 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 in February. Um, bye for now and thanks all. Excuse me, if I may ask something. Of, okay, uh, from... very quickly, yes. Is that, who is that please? Uh, uh, let me just uh, on my video. So can you see me? Yes, yes, go ahead. Is that Jyoti? Yes, ma'am. Okay, please go ahead. Uh, Yes, ma'am. Uh, right now, I'm a second year student of master's course. I'm, but I'm master's in in psychology, and um, I have a, a bit of a stammering problem. <laughs> Please mm -hmm. don't mind. And uh, so uh, I'm right now. I am like uh, searching on like doing my dissertation on uh, disability in pandemic. So I was mm -hmm. hoping that if I could connect with uh, Renu and Janet uh, for uh, discussion.
Absolutely. Job, so very happy to. I'd be really interested to know what you're doing. That sounds get in great. touch with Renu uh, through our website, our CWDS website, and she will put you in touch, I'm sure. Sure, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Ma and thank you for really very insightful presentation. Even I, like for myself, I was like uh, uh, kind of uh, hitting dead end, like everywhere because all like my mode of uh, search is only and only internet. So I was not mm -hmm. able. Um, I'm doing a qualitative research, so I'm mm. not able to connect with the participants uh, right now. And a lot of uh, uh, the uh, connection is with the readings only. Mm. So I was hoping uh, for this. Um, yes, very frustrating times, isn't it? Yes. Uma, would you like to say something? You've unmuted yourself. No, no. I, I... Do you know Uma? Uma no. Chakrabarti, Janet? Yes. yes. No, I, I, just, I actually just... I uh, unmuted myself and put my camera on because I gave it, I wanted to do that clap, uh, which we miss in the, in the Zoom mode. But I like the clap because yes. it, it's the connection between the speaker and everyone, all of us. Well, so thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. I'm deeply honored you were here. Thank you. Okay, bye then. We'll, we'll discuss. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. And please be in touch if you have yes. queries, thoughts, questions. Just Absolutely. Okay, I can uh, just disconnect us now. Thank you. Okay. Bye.